Um, okay, so we are discussing the matter of thesis writing, and the, re the purpose is really just to help you in any way possible and um, answer questions. Um, so I, I will try to say a few words about uh, how, I, how I see this exercise and, and how I think you might want to approach it. Um, and, and then I'm happy, very happy to discuss this with you in, in any way that, that, that you wish. Um, first, an announcement, which is that <clears throat> we'll, uh, Nemanja will be sending this out to everyone in my class. But I have to be, I, 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 I can't make the first morning session. And this is because we have a, a meeting with the National Commission here for, for, for higher education. So that's, that's like a, it's very difficult to schedule. I couldn't change it. I had to take that meeting. So what I will do, excuse me, is add a half hour to each of the sessions that follow. Um, so it'll be um, in the afternoon, we'll start at uh, uh, normal time four, but we'll go to 7.30. In the morning, we'll go to uh, 1.30 and, and so forth, and I'll make up the extra time until you ask me to please stop, and then, you know, then I have your permission to stop. But other, until then, I will try to make up this, this last time. <clears throat> so the thesis then. The, remember the basic requirements. All of you have, well, uh, you have not been here for so long, but uh, the others have been here a bit longer. I, I can't remember. Ah. You're just starting also, yeah. Um, but Paula has been around, and our friends from Chile have been around a little bit more. So, so you know, the basic requirements are that you are doing 12 seminars, normally over a course of two years, and then you have a third year for the master's thesis, and it's the same thing for the PhD, um, though in the PhD we allow, um, well, you, have a t you, have, you are allowed up to seven years to do the PhD which means that conceivably you can spend five years writing the PhD. But you are supposed to do it within two to three years normally, and you have to pay for supervision during that time. So if you are expeditious, you can do it in two years. Most people will take three years. And they pay, f uh, they have a supervision fee, basically, which is, um, which is how, we, how we pay for this process, right? because we're paying the professors involved for their uh, for their time. Um, at the MA level, let me just mention, it is possible to do this quickly if you choose. Um, a lot of students finish in their second year, so they don't take that third year, and they actually save some money. Um, they just, they write their thesis in the second year. And then often they will go on to the PhD, so they'll do four years in a row of coursework, submitting the thesis in the second year. And then when they finish the coursework, they will do uh, two or three years of writing. That's, that's, a, that's a common formula. Um, when you, if you're following the normal process, two years of, for the MA, two years of coursework, then the thesis, you're normally devoting your third year then to supervise study for the thesis. And there's, a, again, a supervision fee. The um, theses are normally read by a fellow, um, one of the teaching fellows, uh, Nemanja, Vesna, Yulia, Pirus. Um, we have a couple others that have been associated with us, Jeremy Fernando, uh, Nico Jenkins. There, there are a number of fellows. Um, they all have PhDs. They all have a lot of experience, so they're quite qualified to, to um, Help you, with it, help you with the MA, because that's the fellow's function. They're supposed to be in an intermediate place, helping you um, do, choose your topic, work through its construction, and then approach it. Uh, but many students also are, uh, they hook up in some way with a professor that they get along with well, and it's possible to have a professor as your PhD uh, supervisor. So the norm is, to, is that a fellow will read the MA thesis. But um, it is if you, if you strike up a relationship with a professor, who, for example, you might be doing a PhD with, then it might be quite normal for that person to read your work. And, um, and that's also possible. Um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, the PhD is a, a supervised by a professor. And in terms of that supervision process, you know, the idea is that 
whether you've done the MA with us or just the PhD, <clears throat> over those 12 seminars that you will have taken, you will be able to identify someone who would be appropriate. And it's not necessarily someone that you've taken a class with. I mean, you, you, know, you don't have to do that. But in the course of those two years, you will have met a lot of professors. You'll have a feeling for, for how, they, how they are. And, um, and it's, it, you will probably strike up some sort of friendship or relationship or affinity. And that person might be the, the appropriate person for you. It's... Uh, that's not necessarily true. I mean, it might be that someone else is more appropriate for your area, and you would like to have them oversee it. Um, the one thing that I would like to recommend is that you, you think mostly in terms of your sense of being able to work well with that person. Um, some people are kind of fixated on this name or that name because it's a bit of a name. And... Um, uh, that's okay. Uh, um, the, the difficulty is that that doesn't necessarily conform to the real, you might say, the chemistry uh, going on or the, you know, the real affinity between the people. And there are some professors that are really very busy. And um, if you choose that person for your supervisor, you probably need to realize you're not going to get as easy access to them as you will to many others. But... Um, but all of the professors that we have currently, I, I believe I, I can say this without hesitation, they're all very responsible. Um, I mean, they have a very strong professional sense. And so uh, they will, they'll take care of you. Um, but I think you want to think about the, this question of you know, chemistry and uh, how you, what, what kind of supervision you're looking for. I, I tell the story that when I did my own PhD, I really did not want supervision. Um, and my, I had two PhD supervisors, and neither of them read the thesis. <laughs> so I, I really did it quite well. I had, very two, <laughs> I, had two, <laughs> I had two distinguished supervisors who I managed to uh, slip by without uh, their reading the thesis. I, wrote, I did write a 30-page précis for uh, Philippe Lecolabat in French, because he just didn't, couldn't be bothered with the English. But... Um, I had to defend it, so it wasn't, it wasn't completely um, uh, uh, you know, off the grid. But um, no, I was, I was someone who really did not seek uh, advising. There are other people who really want you know, a careful advising process um, for whom that's important and valuable. And frankly, I admire that. I just, I, it was just my psyche. I, I just wasn't prepared to submit my stuff to somebody and undergo... Um, that, that, that the criticism and the dialogue, it just wasn't what I wanted. I was, I was working on a very independent path. So uh, what I'm trying to convey with the story is that we all have our, our ways of working. They're all equally legitimate, in my view. And, um, and I think that it's important to come into this exercise with a sense of what it is you're looking for. And then it's easiest to choose the, the best possible person for that. So you... Uh, you know, having written, if you, when you write the MA, um, I mean, it is a, it's, it's a long essay. It's longer normally than most essays you will have written before in, in your undergraduate um, period. But it's not, um, it's not an overwhelming exercise. And if you choose a topic that is, um, how should I say, that is, that is not too esoteric and enigmatic. It should be quite easy, in fact, to build a question that you seek to respond to that, um, that you can address quite, uh, how can I say, quite seriously, quite rigorously, and also relatively easily within the page requirement. And I never have that in my <coughs> mind, but I'm thinking something between 50 and 80 pages, somewhere in that. You will find the requirements. We have uh, MA and PhD requirements on the, on the website. They're, it's a fairly extensive discussion. It's all laid out there. Um, I don't keep that memorized. And the fact that I don't keep mem it memorized also reflects that we are not going to, uh, you know, we're, gonna, we're not going to weigh the thesis when it comes in or, uh, you know, 
it's a, it's a little thin. Uh, no, it, it's, it's really, it's, it's a matter of trying to see whether you have um, carried this through in a way that answers to the problem that you have set for yourselves, the, the question that you have set. The, it's the problematic that you set out, that, you know, the question you set and the, you know, the way of addressing it, which I'm calling the problematic, that will define how long this text should be. Um, because it, it's, it's up to you to define what the question is and then what it will take to answer that question. And that is your, you know, that's your outline. Right? That's, the, that's the thesis proposal and the outline that normally accompanies it to say, okay, I'm going to do, treat this question, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, uh, um, or you know, this, is this topic, then that topic, then that topic, with this, te this text, that text, and that text to support my inquiry. Um, once you lay out the problem in this way, ah, yeah. good to see you. Come sit over here. <clears throat> Oscar, haven't you sat through this thing before? Yeah, I, 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 it's, it's just. <laughs> <laughs> This time he's coming with sharp questions. <laughs> I listened to you last summer, and now I've got some real questions. <laughs> so um, no, I was just talking about the, 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 um, the length of the texts being a function of the problematic that is set up. And, and I honestly do believe that if you set for yourself um, clear question or a clear problem and address what it will take to approach that problem, if only a set of texts that you're going to study in relation to it, then it's not going to be a difficult exercise. Um, and it's, this is where I really urge you to use our fellows to um, to think about that construction of the problematic. Um, sit down, chat with them, tell them what you're thinking of doing, and they will immediately have some texts in mind to suggest to you. You may have them all in your mind, but uh, they, they will have suggestions. Um, they'll listen to you, and they'll help you structure the argument and the, and the um, phrasing of, the, of this thing I'm calling the problematic. And then it's a matter just of addressing it step by step. And um, as I often say, you know, as, it's good to have texts that you are examining toward this question, whatever it is. And then, uh, well, as I say, um, when in doubt, uh, read closely, <laughs> explicate. In other words, give those texts careful consideration. Give those texts readings and produce those readings and make that part of the, the process by which you um, address your question and, and articulate its, its dimensions. Uh, I personally believe very strongly in the value of close reading and you know, careful analysis and a presentation of that analysis. And when you undertake such a thing, pages are really not a problem. It's, it's, um, it, it, it follows you know, just from a careful analysis. So, um, in terms of setting out the problematic, I often, for myself, I may have an intuition or some desire to approach something, and then I have to pass to a stage where I sit down and write out for myself, okay, what is, it, what is it you really want to do with this? What are you trying to do? Where are you trying to go? And when I do that, I will very quickly find myself writing a kind of letter to myself in which I do a kind of exposition of, the, uh, of my, my core concerns, basically. And as I do that, the reason I find, I, you know, we've heard this before, Oscar, but the reason I do this is that a letter is a very relaxed mode of writing. Right? If you, you sit down to do an outline, you know, it might be, you know, it's, it's, you've got to, there's a lot of thinking behind that, right? and, and it, you might get hung up uh, on this at that point. Whereas for me, writing a letter it just starts to flow. But you may have other ways of getting this process going. I, I'm just sharing with you my own. Um, it, it might be that you, you know, for a long period, you are reading and just taking notes. And then, um, and then you start to synthesize those notes in, in relation to 
you know, a question or set of questions. In fact, you might use those notes to start to pose questions for yourself. And then you gather those questions, you know, collect those questions and see what kinds of configurations are presenting themselves or condensations, right? Certain areas are going to be particularly preoccupying you. So um, the, the, I think you can, you know, this process of reviewing notes and studying notes and uh, summarizing notes can be very useful in that way. Uh, when, I, when I do something, I find myself going through, well, let me count the stages. I take initial notes from reading a text. Then I go through, I read those notes, and I try to determine what parts are important to me or what ideas, or, you know, and I, it's in a certain sort of a filtering of the notes. And then once I have the, those ideas, then I start to try to compose this in some sort of an argument of some kind or a presentation of some kind. And I'm constantly writing down, okay, that page number was useful for this idea or that idea. And once I have that, normally what I'll do, once I have that stage um, achieved, I'll go back and reread the notes and start copying out some of those citations for myself, which I will then use in the presentation. And it's very helpful to go back after this point of synthesis to the notes, because then they present themselves in a new, a new light. And you will find supportive things, but you'll also find things that challenge you a bit. And, but everybody has their working modality. It's, it's, um, there is no correct way of going about this. But I do want to suggest a sort of a, a do I want to say insistent use of notes, um, which offer a record and when you take those notes and you have ideas, pause to write those ideas. This has actually been a big problem in my own work. I always forget. I always say, oh, I'm never going to forget that. And you know, I have an idea, and I say, oh, I, I, no, I want to keep working here. I'm not going to take time to write it down. And then I get two days later, I can't remember what in heaven's name I, I had understood. Immense time is lost this way. Um, so let me urge you to not make that mistake. When you have a thought, write it down. <laughs> Catch it. <laughs> And not, don't just catch it. Don't, there's another problem I have. My notebooks are filled with these little things, right? Two or three sentences. And I look at it and say, what was I thinking? Yeah. You have to expand a little bit. Try to expand. Let it, let it, let it, let it work a little bit. Um, but do, re do retain these things. And, um, you know, that means that then going back over all this material. But it's a very, for me, it has always been a very productive exercise to go back over and over with notes and synthesize and refine and condense and, and then turn into an argument. Now, I, I come to a point that I always come to um, in this discussion, which is the, the moving to the point of writing and, um, and undertaking this. Actually, I've, I've, I've gotten ahead of myself just a little bit undertaking this project as an academic project, because we are doing academic theses, or we're asking for academic theses. We don't take um, uh, um, artistic works, or we do take artistic works, but they have to be included in a discursive presentation that is um, effectively an analysis of those works, or um, a presentation of their meaning and context, and. Uh, uh, the nature of the intervention that they represent. Um, so it is an academic exercise, and I always want to urge people to treat it as an academic exercise, because that is a great help in this process. Um, a, a lot of people approach this with the sense that they want to write a book that has been in them for some time, and uh, or that they've dreamed of writing, or that's their ambition to bring in onto, onto paper. And I think it's very important to try to be, take a more humble approach, and, and that is to say, find your question, articulate your question, and then approach it in a style that, is, that, you, that you will know from, from your readings as, as, a, as an analytic and academic style, whereas, where you're turning to secondary resources, um, you know, other, other voices that have 
approach this topic. I say it this way because if you present to yourself a desire to write a book, you know, with a capital B, um, you really are putting a gigantic burden on your shoulders. And I think you should understand the thesis as the preparation for such a book. The book will be written after you do your thesis, right? if, if, it, if, it, if you are so impelled. Um, it, it is, the thesis will, will basically break open the ground and lay out the uh, essential structure of what it is that, that you're trying to approach. You can go back afterwards and you know, get rid of the academic side, give it a more colorful presentation, a richer articulation, and present it as a book. But at the stage that you are in here, think of it as an academic exercise. Think of it as, uh, as an exercise. And, and what an MA thesis or a PhD thesis represent are, uh, the two of them are um, demonstrations that you've received, you, you've achieved a certain level of competence as an academic. Right? It's, it is a, it's an exercise that demonstrates competence. If you treat it that way, it'll, it'll be less pressure than if you think about it as, as, a, as a book, you know, that is for a broad public. And, and part of the reason is that when you write a book for a broad public, it is very hard to conceive of your audience. It's very hard. Whereas when you write an academic thesis, it is much easier to, uh, well, to conceive uh, who your audience is and how to speak to them. And who your audience is is your thesis supervisor, first of all, and the small group that will be on the committee that, um, that reviews it, the, the, the defense committee. At EGS, the defense committee is, is three people. It's um, normally the thesis supervisor and then two other professors. We can allow that one of those two other people be someone from outside the EGS, if they are appropriate for some reason. Um, but it's, it's just three people. It's a relatively short exercise. And, um, and those are the ones that you're writing for. Those, the, those are the runs, ones that you are trying to get past in this initial step. And then having completed this, this work, um, you'll be in a position, I think, to take it in hand in a different way and cast it for a different public. And that, that can happen, it can be done very quickly. I mean, it's uh, trans, transforming a thesis into a, a book presentation is not a terribly difficult task from a rhetorical point of view. Because the work will be done. And, um, you know, and then it's a matter of adopting a slightly different voice and letting it flow in that other voice. But so do think about the academic thesis as something like a first draft. If, if your ambition is, writing, is to write a book, think about the thesis as the first draft. Um, I, when I make this argument about treating it in this, as an academic exercise, I don't mean to lessen the importance or you're feeling invested in this project. I don't mean to lessen that at all. It's not, um, this isn't a cynical um, recommendation that I'm giving you. I talk about it a little bit cynically, but that's not what I mean to, to, to convey. Um, it, it is, um, I, I think it's really extremely important to choose a question that means something to you. Um, it might be that there is something enigmatic in some philosophical or literary text or a form of art that you, you really want to get to. And, uh, and so your, your, your problem becomes um, how to approach this, this thing you know, that, that, is, that, that attracts you. Your question may have to do with um, some sociopolitical issue. And you may have a very deep ish, uh, um, investment in that issue. And again, I think there's a real passion at work in the choice of that topic and then the way it's approached. But my, what I want to urge you is, so I, I, I want to say, don't, 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 um, don't avoid that passion, work with it. You know, uh, uh, allow yourself to be um, informed, you know, to become enthusiastic about your, your problem with this, this passion. But again, don't, 
don't feel you need to write the definitive statement uh, um, for the public immediately. This is, this, is the, this is an opportunity to work through the dimensions of the question, to do it with others around you, your supervisor, uh, other, your, your colleagues, other students, um, fellows. This is an opportunity to really uh, open up the field uh, that you're working in, that, you know, uh, the field of your question, and really uh, examine all the different dimensions of it and how to pose the questions and, uh, and develop them. So use it in, in that. It's a, again, it's an exercise, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's like an experimental field. It's a, it's a, it's a place in which to develop this, this problematic. Um, let's see, what can I add to that? The PhD thesis is something, uh, the, the MA thesis is a little bit less like this, but not necessarily. The PhD thesis is something will, that will be with you always. I, I'm not fully sure why this is. I think it's because for most people, it's the first big project. And <clears throat> the nature of the work, the nature of the investment is such that um, it becomes, it really marks you in a sense. But it also becomes, because it marks you in that way and is so important, it becomes like a, it's a very fertile basis for future projects. Uh, um, that's certainly the way my own thesis worked, and I've, I've seen this many times. So, again, I, I, when I tell you it's an academic exercise, I'm not playing down the importance of this. But part of the reason it becomes so important for your future is that you will have worked through many dimensions of a question. You'll have glimpsed questions that need more development. Uh, you'll have grasped things that, um, that, that require more attention later. And so this thing becomes very, um, very uh, for most people, it becomes very fertile as, a, as, as an initial um, undertaking. And so I think, a PhD, I think an MA thesis is important, and a PhD thesis is very important. I think, I think, it's, a, I think it's a wonderful thing in this respect. And, but it's, it, it mustn't become, uh, how could I say, a, a, a sort of fantasmatic burden. And that's why I'm telling you, don't write a book, write a thesis, right? <laughs> write an academic thesis. You, you, don't want, um, you don't want the phantasm of writing a definitive statement to be haunting you through this process. Let, let your inspiration come through serious work, you know, serious, serious study and related to your topic. Um, and then in the writing, you, you know, you, you, you may feel at certain times that you're writing something that is so banal, so simple, so obvious, so dry, but if you have really invested in this topic and you've done you know, real study, I can virtually guarantee you in interesting things are going to happen when the writing starts. And, and uh, sometimes you have to just persist with the feeling that this is not terribly exciting or important, but the inspiration will come. And those are wonderful moments. And, you know, and follow them. When they hit, follow them. Write as much as you can. Um, but it will be, again, in telling you that this is an exercise, I'm not um, denying that there will be moments of inspiration and, and excitement. In fact, I'm, I'm virtually certain this is going to come. And that's why it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful and ultimately important exercise. Because the act of writing, the practice of writing will produce something beyond what you expected. And you never know what's going to happen when, when you start. I mean, you have some idea, but what comes out will take on a very um, uh, singular form and, um, and let inspiration come to you in that process. So again, approach it in a work person-like <laughs> manner. Um, you know, you're, you're demonstrating an academic proficiency, academic capacity. And then let the inspiration come. Uh, because you're working on a topic that's important to you and will have thought about it carefully and studied other voices on this topic, then when you come to write it yourself, things will happen. And that's, that's wonderful. That's, uh, that's a great pleasure.
it's a good feeling to finish this stuff. Right? <laughs> it is. It's a really good feeling. It's a, you might finish, when you finish, you say, oh, okay, I had to get that through. I had to get it done on time. Uh, it's, it's kind of weak here. I know where the weakness is. Somehow nobody noticed, et cetera. I mean, you may say, so, but it, it's, it's important. It stays with you, and you'll come back to it in various ways. So actually, I think it's something you should look forward to, really. It's, it's, um, it's, it, it's, it's, an, it's always ends up being an achievement of some kind. It's, uh, it's a little bit like building a violin. It doesn't matter how bad it sounds. You say, wow, look at that. <laughs> it's been really fun to build those violins. Whew. I got to hear my violin from August played next to a, a Stradivari by a professional last, last weekend. Wow. That was, that, was, that was interesting. Questions? Yeah. I have mentioned already that what I would say to limitations or expectations is it part of education? Um, you know, I was just saying, just before you arrived, Greg, um, the, uh, we have requirements uh, or expectations listed on the website, and I honestly can't remember those, those numbers. No. Yeah. Okay. That's the that's the PhD thesis. That's the PhD thesis. Yeah. Two hundred fifty or three hundred pages. A lot of lot of theses come out at one hundred and eighty. So so again, don't worry about this. Okay. But it, it really. That number is intimidating. I have to say. I'm sorry. That number is very intimidating. Don't think about it. That's what I. That, six, six figures. Don't think about six figures. Listen to this. Six <laughs> just, just remember. <laughs> if you translate this into money, you'll be happy it stayed in the five figures in this, uh, in this institution. Um, no, honestly, don't think in those terms. If you, if you're worried about page length, it, it's an abstract pressure that you're putting your, uh, on yourself. The real the real point, you, you set a question for yourself and figure out what this question requires if you're going to address it in a way that's satisfactory in terms of an academic approach and two, satisfactory for you in terms of the kinds of texts you want to bring to bear, the ideas that you want to consider. And you, know, you lay this out, in the, as I say, in the problematic. And when you lay out what your, your topic is, you are dictating at that point what this is going to take. And it's, um, and it's, it really, there's almost a, uh, what's, I don't know what the right word is, it's probably an uh, architectonics here that's, uh, but I, I want to say it's almost organic. In other words, the, 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 the formulation of the question is going to define uh, what is an appropriate number of pages. And that's the way it will be assessed. We, as I said, we won't, we won't come in and weigh it. Um, or you know, count pages um, to verify that it's actually your numbering is appropriate, or check to see if the f if you've been cheating on the font, or your spaces are a little bit. Not, I mean, that we we really have no interest in that. Oh, about export. Well, I was, yeah, I could come back to that. Yeah, I, um, as I was, so just to finish, you know, the core idea is that your topic is going to define how long this should be. Now, everybody has their individual ways of developing uh, arguments and ideas. We had one last summer that was, if normally spaced, would have been a thousand pages. Um, and it was kind of insane. Uh, and all of us were suffering. So why do we have to read a thousand pages? But um, you know, nobody. Uh, th there is a rule that it can't be too long. But nobody came and said, "Look, we, we're going to have to cut." Um, we simply, you know, we, we worked with it. Um, 
There are some people who actually do find themselves writing in too succinct a way. They have trouble developing. Ah, wait and see if I believe that. But anyway, <laughs> the, what, what uh, um, Pirouz was, was suggesting to me just now is you might remember at that point that line that I used a few minutes ago, when in doubt, explicate. Uh, if, you're, if, you are, if you feel you're not developing enough, use a text that speaks to you in some important way. Read that text. Bring that reading into the um, analysis of your topic. And that will, uh, that will help you in terms of, of development and, and you know, this, this page question. But honestly, if you're worrying about pages, you, you, this, is a, this is an abstract concern. It's, it's, um, you know, the real issue is, have you, raised, have you presented your question or your topic in a sufficiently developed way so that when you sit down and work through the different aspects that you've laid out, you know, it, should, it should work for itself almost. It's, um, as you write, there are going to be new twists and turns that present themselves. That's fine. You don't have to strict, stay strictly adhering to your, your, your initial outline. But if you have a, you know, a clearly articulated problematic and you can work with the fellows on this, page is not, not a problem. I really want to urge that because, you know, this is a process. Um, it's a process that you are being prepared for. All of these seminars that you're taking, all the readings that you're doing um, throughout the year, not just for the courses, but throughout the year, all of this is, you're imbibing a, an academic discourse, discursive form. Um, whether you like it or not. I mean, it's, it's happening. It's shaping you. And you are noticing what constitutes a, 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 a strong argument or, and how an argument is presented. You're noticing that with your professors. I mean, that some people speak to you, right? And you say, I, I, I want to think like that. Or, or you may not even say that to yourself, but you start doing it. It's, you know, in all, in all study uh, up through the PhD, there's a very strong dimension, a mimetic dimension. You, you recognize this person poses a question in a way I want to learn, and then you start following the gestures of thinking. Some of the gestures, some of you, well, not, not so many people follow me, but you know, some of them will imitate all this stuff. But um, no, but there are, everybody has gestures of thought, ways of approaching questions. Um, uh, they're almost, it's almost a method. It's almost that, that they pursue in trying to take up a topic. And you will, you will learn this um, by observing those that, that, that most interest you. So you are in training, right? And the idea is that when you come to write the master's thesis, you're doing it at a certain level of expertise, right? You're just getting, in principle, just getting started raising a big question and following it through. When you get to the PhD, you've had another two years of, of study, and you have a much more developed rhetorical and rhetorical sense in, in, in a very deep uh, respect, both rhetorical in terms of the construction of the topoi and in terms of the articulation of the language. But uh, so you should, you should work with a confidence when you're writing the PhD thesis that all of this is in you. Right? And now it's a matter of just working through the steps. Um, it's not a matter of suddenly having to invent the idea of a PhD. No, no it's, you, you've been prepared for this. And so and just as you work through the, the steps involved, writing, you know, choosing the topic, writing the proposal and the outline, doing the reading required, and, and it's going to write itself if you work with confidence, I think. There are moments when, you know, you'll hit obstacles, undoubtedly. You may have to shift this way or that way. You realize that some, something that you had thought you understood, you didn't understand so well, and, and you have to re, redefine. But all of this most frequently offers opportunity more than um, obstacle. And um, I think it's a matter really of, a, of accepting that you really are well trained in this, um, in this process. I want to say that with a little qualification, because obviously, if you were in a in a in a in, a, in an educational institution that was obliging you to write thirty-page papers 
every month, um, you would have a different kind of preparation. Uh, we have a more intensive form, which allows you also to do other things. Right? So it's, um, you know, it, has, it has strengths and its weaknesses in that way. But you have had extensive training. The, the, think about it, when you do the PhD, you've done 24 seminars, like the three days that you know, we've been going through this time. That is an awful lot. Um, it's a lot more than you get in most European institutions, in fact. And along with all the reading and, and then talking and exchanges, it, it amounts to a very significant preparation. So when you, when you come to write, you know, write with a sense that you're, you're ready. You're ready. And, um, uh, and then just do it in that sense of that academic exercise that I'm describing. Right? And then something's going to come out. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see what it is. But you know, do it with the, the, the sort of the combination of humility and also confidence that you, you know that you are prepared to do this academic exercise. And then let's see what comes out. You all work with different backgrounds, different experience, different different ways of writing. You know, expressing yourselves. Some are, some are truly writers, some are less so. Um, so it's always a different experience. You know? but, uh, but I do think that by the time you're writing your PhD, you're ready to write your PhD. And, um, and it should be, should be a rich experience for you. That was a long-winded answer. <laughs> Yeah. Do we have to write it It very much depends on the circumstances. And by that I mean ultimately the requirements are defined by the supervisor. So that when you work with a supervisor, you will work out with them what they expect and in what form. Not everybody wants, <clears throat> well, you should always write some form of proposal because you have to present it to them. Right? They need to see what it is you, you want to do. And just describing it is not enough. You really should <clears throat> lay out uh, in, in, in a descriptive form what it is you want to do and how you think that you're going to approach it. So a proposal is not required, but it's kind of important for, for getting started. It's especially important if you don't have immediately a thesis supervisor in mind. Uh, because then m my job comes in. I have to help you, excuse me, get connected with somebody. Um, and for that, it's very important that there be a proposal that I can show and discuss with uh, potential supervisors. Um, Well, it, again, it depends on the process. You might have somebody immediately. You know, you might have somebody that you have already identified as the person you want to work with, and you may speak with them, and they say, yeah, I'd be happy to do it. In which case, it's, it's just a matter of, it's between you and them, except that you need to tell us that this is happening and that it is underway. That's right. You inform us that it's happening. We need to know that because we need to pay the supervisor. We also need to know that you're well set up because um, if we don't have that information, we are assuming that you are not yet set up and it's a problem that we need to address. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, some people sometimes run their ideas by me. Do you think such and such a person would be good? And um, that's a very, it's a very difficult question for me to answer, just because it's not easy to say, no, that person's a jerk. You don't want to work with them. <laughs> it doesn't happen much, but it, you know, sometimes I do feel I need to offer a word of warning and for some reason or other. Um, but. Uh, I, look, I'm there to advise you, really. And I, I always describe myself, I'm the default supervisor. As long as you don't have a supervisor, I'm the supervisor. 
And, and actually, that's literally the case. Um, because we have to tell the Maltese authorities um, that, uh, yes, each person is accounted for and is, and is being um, supervised, taken care of. So you may not have a formal supervisor that you, know, that you are going to be necessarily working with, but you've always got me <laughs> um, as, as, uh, as responsible for you. And, um, and I sometimes have to function as a supervisor for some time before someone else comes in, or people end up working with me. So, and some people even choose to work with me for that. <laughs> well, I hate to say so. I hate to say things about certain professors. <laughs> I worked with Piruz a little bit, but I'm not a film guy, so I, I was kind of a hanger on. But that's right. He worked with me for three and a half years. <laughs> it's like psychoanalysis. It's very hard to hard, very hard to bring that to a close. <laughs> no, we we it, it, this is a it's complicated for us because because we are so dispersed, and sometimes it takes a little time for you to. Um, to identify someone, and it becomes really important for us that you just stay in touch, that we know what's going on. Um, uh, and we'll do our best to stay in touch on our end, but there are a lot of students to look after, a lot of problems to, to, to address, and so it's easy for, easy for us to lose sight of someone for a while. So I, I would just urge you, please be in touch uh, uh, in this process, and, and all the more so in the form of asking for help. You know, in whatever form that takes. That's what. That's why we have fellows. Really, it's um, it's about uh, having people present to answer your your concerns. And I also I I will do my best. You know, to answer whatever concerns you have. Oscar, you must be getting close to the stage now. Yeah. How are you feeling about your PhD thesis? Are you ready to go? Paula. <laughs> I wrote the thing that you said that I write a letter and decipher that. Did it work? I, I do it. I, should, I, I can't help it out of way. But I don't write a formal letter, but I'm a manifesto. Oh, okay, a manifesto, that's great. <laughs> you could probably publish that directly. <laughs> Yeah, it's for you. It's for you. And then that prompts uh, to actually get some shape or form, and I send that to a possible advisor. Yeah, good. To read it in out, and we're going to work it out. Excellent. OK, then good. Then we're going to refine the real shape of that. But, yeah. But it's helping to do that. I mean, a letter or something that there's no like, academic format that I don't have to like, quote or, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's, this, is a, this is a funny dimension about rhetoric. I am, um, there's certain forms that at certain moments I can't do. I just, I can't stand it, you know. And, like, I can't write a journal. For the life of me, I can't write a journal. But I can write a letter to myself. It's strange. <laughs> but it's a, it's a rhetorical form. You know, it just releases something in me. You know? So whatever works, you know. Whatever works. It's done already? So what are you doing here? <laughs> are you serious? Because I already did. I, that was an hour ago. <laughs> Two hours ago. Yeah. I had a good time. A very good time. We were, uh, I'll tell you, speaking about the violins, so I, I, I was part of the group that made violins in August, and um, Robert is now taking it. Uh, he wants, with my violin, he wants to tune it a bit more. And, um, and we were supposed to stain it and, you know, and then varnish it. But he, he wants to do some more um, 
more tuning and, and examining this. It's, I think he's using it a little bit as a, as, as a test case. And it's also because I, I go to events with him with this instrument. He wants it to be in good form. So um, just now, he was, we were talking about how changes in the, in the structure can, can produce really significant alterations in, uh, you know, in, in, it, in its, the way it plays, but also the, the you know, character of the sound, the quality of the sound. So um, first he moved the sound, uh, the, the, the peg, I forget what it's called. Who was there? The sole, yeah, it's called the sole of the violin, but it's, the, it's that little peg that, uh, that, that, that one inserts in between the two, the, the top and the bottom half. And uh, so he was moving it about, and it was absolutely amazing how the sound changed, wasn't it? And it's just, um, just this little piece moves it a tiny bit, and suddenly the, the violin starts sounding different, differently. Um, but then with mine, he, we were, well, they were trying, everybody was participating and giving their reactions to the sound. Um, but there was some, well, from Antonin in particular, there was some concern about the middle range. He, uh, he really likes the sound of the violin, but he said, maybe we can work at this. So um, Robert brought out a scraper and started scraping away the wood on the top of the violin. So this violin is supposedly finished, but now he's starting changed the, the shape of it. And, and he said, now this is an irreversible change. <laughs> he starts, because before you can move that little sound peg around in various ways, you can you know, set up in different ways, but that's an irreversible change. He was lessening the thickness of the, um, uh, of the, the top part um, to the, uh, if, if the violin's facing you, uh, to the right of the, the right f -hole. And in order to make that, which is apparently extremely active, part of the violin to make it a little bit more um, uh, flexible. So it's a, it's a little bit like a tweeter in a, in a, in a um, speaker. And he was showing some, um, some studies um, of the way the violin, the wood of the violin moves while it's being played. Did, did you get to see those? He had it on the, on the screen. <clears throat> It's unbelievable. They're using some very sophisticated technology to watch how the, how the wood is moving. And it's that particular area that moves most uh, dramatically. And so um, he did this, you know, and I'm watching. And at one point, I don't know, Nemanja, if you, you know, he, he did that on the cello, and he admitted tonight that it's the first time he's ever done it. And I thought, damn. I remember Christophe Coin was, was scared while he was doing it and <laughs> asked him to stop. <clears throat> but anyway, he's, he was doing it again just now, and uh, that's quite fascinating to see how these little little adjustments make for profound changes in the character of the, of the instrument. Anyway, just sharing with you that fun. I'm really enjoying that. Other questions? Yeah. Not on the MA thesis. No, there's only the person reading it who is to um, accept it. There's no, there's no defense of the MA thesis. Is it just passed or not passed, not grades or...? There are no grades. Um, MA theses... Or the PhD? The PhD we assign honors to, or not. But... Um, <laughs> can you pass without honors? You can pass without honors. Okay. Yeah, you can pass without honors. Um, I mean, we like to give honors, but, <laughs> but there are some you have to pass without honors. <laughs> I like uh, to give one. <laughs> there's one thing that, that to, to remember. Um, the defense itself is not a scary event for the simple reason that your supervisor would not let you defend the thesis if they didn't believe it, it was ready. Yeah. And their own reputation or, or name or, you know, when, uh, well, their, their, their legitimacy is, is, on the, is on the line, right, each yeah. time. And so, um, you know, sometimes students are really, really anxious about the defense, and I, I want to tell them, look, if you're here at the defense, things are okay. It's, um, you wouldn't be here if it wasn't okay. So, uh, you know, as you work with your supervisor, the, um, 
the word of your supervisor is the most important thing. Yes, and we also can do it by Skype if necessary. A lot of people really prefer to do it in person, and I understand that. Um, but it is possible to have a, a, a Skype defense. Sometimes it's just too expensive to come, or too complex. People have families, and so I mean, it's, we just try to accommodate as best we can. Well, you can always ask me questions in other contexts. Um, the, Sorry? We should probably say Skype is not in this room. It's usually <laughs> in a fire right. space. I, I saw your expression. In a slightly uh, more propitious space. It would probably be in Celsius. It looks like normal. I mean, when, we, when we've done it in fast space, it's, it's controlled. Yeah. yeah. No, but I was thinking it could somehow. That's also possible. I mean, New York would be feasible. Yeah, if a, yeah, I mean, New York is, we have a good concentration there. That would be, that would be feasible. <laughs> Belgrade is a great spot, too. <laughs> Chile, yeah. You want to do a double defense? You, you two are always together, so I can see that would be something. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Come visit Chile. I see. So you want to do a trio, a threesome? <laughs> yes. In fact, I have to find out what Christian's up to. <laughs> yes, tell him that. that. That will spur him. I'll get an anxious letter. I, I know. <laughs> but I saw him in August, I believe. Yeah, good. I saw him in August. Too. So it's not so long, but. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And. Um... <laughs>